good morning. Welcome to Estacada Community Fellowship. It's awesome to be back. One of my favorite parts of church is watching people actually chat with each other and enjoy each other in community. It's fantastic. There is not a man or a beast and on the land or underneath. Nothing that could ever come between the love you have for me. I can lay my head down in Sheol. I can make my bed in the bottom of the darkness deep. There is not a place I could escape you because your heart won't stop coming after me. Your heart won't stop coming after me. Your heart won't stop. Coming after you, coming after me. There's not an angel, there's not an angel in the stars. There's not a devil in the dark Nothing that could change the way you are Or the love you have for me No, no, no Because your heart won't stop coming after me Your heart won't stop coming after me Your heart won't stop coming after me you coming after me
Here I am to say 
Father God, we thank you that in times like this, we can see ourselves how we really are in relation to you. And we thank you that your righteousness and your holiness is what creates a presentable us to you. And we are aware of that this morning and we don't take it lightly or for granted. And we offer the rest of this morning in worship of your name. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, go ahead. You can. I have what for some of you may be a new song to share. Um, it's probably about 15 years old, so maybe in the deep, deep, deep recesses of your memory. <laughs> It might come back to you. It's called Once Again by a, a gentleman by the name of Matt Redman. Um, I'd like to, if you don't know it, I'd like to teach you the verses and the chorus of it um, as we prepare our hearts for communion. If you've got the communion elements this morning, um, you can take communion at any point in this song that you want to. Uh, we're not going to direct you. If you did not get communion elements, the door Giovanni has them available. You can just put up your hand and he'll bring some to you. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. Once again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy, and I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Let's try that chorus again together. Once again. But once again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy, and I'm broken inside. But once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. So thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my you are now you are 
exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at this saving grace, and I'm full of praise once again. I'm full of praise, and I'm full of praise once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you die. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my
To see your kingdom come Here we go My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives Here we go My Redeemer lives My Redeemer Especially right there at the end. We would like to, at this point, if there are children in the room that would like to go with Giovanni to the children's ministry. I don't know if there are any announcements. Nope, no announcements today. Whew, we dodged a bullet there. Thank you so much for having me and us back. Um, it's an absolute blast to worship with you guys. It's just so meaningful and rich. These guys? I think you probably know this guy. This is Brett, longtime friend of mine from way back in the day. He's bistatual, um, from Texas and Oregon. Um, this is Julio Valpando. Julio and I have worshiped together, whew, since you were 15, right? And you are how old now? Wow, 15 years of our life wasted together. I love you, brother. This is Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson showed up at the church where I worship, pastored at. Um, Probably in 2007, Probably. something like that. Right. <laughs> His whole family is like just dedicated to worship, and it's such a privilege to be able to to mentor this this young man and his brother Josh and Isaiah. There's just too many to introduce. He comes with a whole brood.
What a beautiful morning, don't you think? It's going to go beyond beautiful though, pretty quick. <laughs> shopping center just before Christmas. The wife suddenly noticed that her husband was missing. They had a lot to do, so she called him on her cell phone. Where are you? Yeah. got a lot of stuff to do here today. He replied, do you remember that jewelry store we went to about 10 years ago? And you fell in love with that diamond necklace? We couldn't afford it at the time. I said that one day I'd get it for you. Little tears started to flow down her cheek, and she got all choked up. Yes, she said, I do remember that shop. Well, he said, I'm in the bar next to that shop. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's a bad one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My friends, I've been thinking a lot about our little church here and wondering how to go about bringing back folks that went missing during this COVID thing. I also think that I've done a pretty poor job of teaching the importance of meeting together on Sundays and any other time that we are supposed to gather. The church doesn't function properly when our people are missing. It's like a little piece of the church is missing when you're not here. And I, I truly do appreciate the diversity of backgrounds represented when we are all present. We have people from just about every walk of life and, and religious background as well within our group. And truthfully, it's not always an easy thing because we have some pretty strong opinions about different things, don't we? But generally, I think this diversity makes us stronger and keeps us from wandering from the truths of the Bible. I think many of us have seen what can happen when our opinions and our, our customs and our habits become too big of a part of our doctrine. That's what's happened to many of the old denominations that kind of went all in with liberalism. But our main focus won't change. We will continue to look to the cross of Christ as we continue to learn more about our God, we need to know who God is because knowing Him is foundational to everything else in life. If the foundation's weak or cracked, how can you build upon it? When I look back at my life and some of the problems I've faced over the years, I can see that many of my poor choices have come as a result of my inadequate understanding or wrong view of God. I see that often in others as well. It's amazing what getting a right view of God can do to, to help you out in the challenges of life. Today I want to talk a little about our freedom as believers and about the glory of God the glory of God is a huge topic that we really can't do justice to in a, just a little short time today. I'd like to take our text for today and simply ask what, is, what it is that Paul is trying to tell us. What does it mean? That may not tell us all we'd like to know about the glory of God, but it's, it's a place to start. It's a hook to hang some thoughts on. So first of all, let's talk about the word glory. The most common Old Testament word for glory is kabod, which can mean heavy. The same word was used in Genesis 31 for animals heavy laden with gold. The word also refers to the shining light of God's presence. That glory was the cloud by day and that fiery pillar by night that led the people of God through the wilderness. Later, it was the light that filled the tabernacle and the temple. Exodus, Exodus 24, 17 tells us that God's glory was like a consuming fire on the top of Mount Sinai. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan preacher, called glory the sparkling 
of deity, the sparkling of deity. I think I like that. Then as we move into the New Testament, we meet a Greek word, doxa, from which we get the English word doxology. This Greek word has the idea of honor and dignity and reputation. That last word, reputation, brings us very close to the meaning of glory in 1 Corinthians 10.31. One writer said it this way, God's glory is his reputation in the world. To live for God's glory means to live so that God's reputation is enhanced, not diminished, end quote. Now, in one sense, you and I cannot diminish God's glory. It exists forever because God's eternal. C.S. Lewis said, you cannot diminish God's glory any more than a madman can diminish the sun merely by scribbling darkness on the walls of his cell. However, you can cause others to see the glory of God or to dismiss it, dismiss it entirely by the personal choices you make every day. So with that little bit of background, let's turn to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. As we come to these verses, we need to remember that Corinth was a major seaport in ancient Greece. We talked about this a number of times before. It was a meeting point for various cultures, Greek and Roman and other Mediterranean peoples, a melting pot not unlike America. It was also a very depraved city, given over wholly to idol worship and sexual immorality, also not like, unlike America. The city was filled with idol shrines and was dominated by the famous temple of Aphrodite, where a thousand male and female prostitutes worked their trade. Central to idol worship was the bringing of food offerings to the idol altars. There the food would be accepted by the priests and some of it would be offered to the idols by burning. The rest might be eaten by the priests or sold in the market. That last fact posed a problem for the young Christians at Corinth, most of whom had been saved out of a very pagan lifestyle. They were faced with several questions. Is it all right for a Christian to eat a meal at a pagan temple? What about buying and eating meat that had been offered to idols? What if a pagan friend invited you for a meal? Should you go or not? These questions, which may seem arcane to us, were very real and very practical to those early Christians. In answering them, Paul lays down some vital principles that transcend the local questions of the day. These principles are just as valid today as they were 2,000 years ago. As we look at them, perhaps we'll understand better what it means to live in the light of God's glory. So let's go right to our text at chapter, uh, verse 23 of chapter 10. Paul writes, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Stop there a minute. Now, these verses tell us a couple of important facts. A, not everything's good for me, and B, not everything that's good for me is good for someone else. Everything is permissible. For the Christian, that doesn't give us a license to sin, but it does mean that God isn't looking over our shoulders, trying to catch us in a mistake. No, as Christians, we are truly free in the deepest sense of the word, except in those areas where God's Word clearly lays down a prohibition, we are completely free. However, freedom may easily be abused. Just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. Furthermore, none of us lives on an island. Our choices impact other people. That means we have to stop and think. How will other Christians feel about the choice I'm making. That doesn't always mean we won't do it anyway, but we have to stop and ask. Look at verse 25. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising concerns of conscience. 
for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience' sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should I, my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? Here we get down to specific cases. In this passage, Paul answers some very specific questions. First of all, is it okay for Christians to join in the feast held in the idol temples? The answer is yes and no. In one sense, it's okay because the idols themselves are nothing. However, demons operate behind and through the idols. And for Christians to participate in those feasts, to have fellowship with demon spirits and to involve themselves in spiritual compromise. Therefore, although you can go and perhaps not be harmed, you should stay away because of the evil associations. Secondly, what about buying meat that's been sacrificed to idols? That's fine, no problem. Meat's meat, nothing more. The earth is the Lord's. It all belongs to Him. If you want to eat meat, some meat that's been offered to idols, go right ahead. But what if a pagan friend invites you over for a meal and serves you meat that's been offered to idols? Well, no problem. He didn't give thanks to God. The pagan may think he's honoring his idol, but you know that everything belongs to the one true God. So eat it and enjoy it and don't worry about anything. But what if a third person at the dinner party, perhaps a new believer, sees you about to eat meat that's been offered to an idol and he calls it to your attention? This is a problem because you know it's okay to eat the meat, but your brother or sister is troubled and his or her conscience bothered. What do you do? Well, easy. You put down your fork and you push the steak away. You say, pass the vegetables, please. You know it's okay, but your friend doesn't. And for the sake of his conscience, you refuse to eat the meat. Why trouble your friend over such a trivial thing as eating meat? Why risk hurting him and harming your testimony? There are several implications of this truth. Clearly, Paul didn't mind eating meat offered to idols. But he didn't do it all the time or indiscriminately. Sometimes he voluntarily refused to eat meat lest he hurt another Christian brother. The same principle holds for all of us. Sometimes you will, but sometimes you won't. Circumstances matter. People matter. Details matter. Some might think it's such a small thing. To which I would answer, in the Christian life, there are no small decisions. Every choice you make matters to God and others. You never made a small decision and you never will. Think about it for a minute. Your decisions touch every area of your life. They touch the clothes you wear and the cars you drive. It touches the books you read and the movies you watch. Touches the radio stations you listen to and the shows you watch on TV. It touches your personal habits, your language, your friendships, the places you go to eat, and the things you drink. It touches the people you hang out with and the things you do with the people you hang out with. All of it, all of it matters to God. Perhaps you've heard it said that The devil's in the details, so is God. He cares about what you do because his reputation is at stake in the choices you make. 30 years ago, evangelicals had an easy way of handling this problem. We simply said, don't. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't play cards, don't go to movies. Everything was don't, don't, don't. You remember some of them days? Nowadays, we don't say don't very often, do we? 
Instead, we hear, oh, if it feels good, do it. In our wisdom, we've gone to the opposite extreme. We're so afraid of being called legalists that we hardly say no to anything. But I'm not sure we've made any great spiritual advance over the previous generation. I'm against legalism, and I'm all in favor of Christian liberty, but only when we use liberty as God intended. Look at verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. These verses contain Paul's summary statement. What does it mean to do all for the glory of God? Well, here are three answers. Seek to offend no one. Please everyone if possible. And seek the salvation of as many as possible. We see the genius of Paul's life here. He had but one ambition, to win men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else mattered to him. Paul was no legalist. Far from it. In fact, he was the last person to live by an artificial set of rules and regulations. He cared nothing about pleasing men just to please them. On the other hand, he would do whatever it took to win somebody to Christ. Eat meat? Fine. Let's have a T-bone. Vegetarian? Pass the sprouts, please. Jewish? Let's go to the temple and pray together. Greek? Let's talk about philosophy. Roman, how about those gladiators and pretty amazing fellows? Keep the Sabbath, fine, I'll keep it with you. Work on Saturday, no problem. I'll see you at Bible study tonight. Tent makers, hey, great, that's what I do in my spare time. And on it went with Paul. Paul lived and breathed the gospel. His message never changed, never. He preached the same gospel everywhere he went, but he changes methods to fit his audience. Why? To pander them? No. To remove any barriers and gain a hearing for the gospel. Whatever it took to reach people, Paul was willing to do it. How does this apply to us today, you might ask? People watch the way we live, and they draw conclusions about our values from what we do and what we don't do where we go and where we don't go, the things we say, the jokes we tell, the songs we sing, the books we read, the shows we watch on TV, and the things we post on social media. All of those things send a message about our ultimate values. People are watching all the time. So live in such a way that God is glorified In so doing, you'll create many opportunities to share the gospel. There's a simple question that will replace many of the do's and don'ts, and it's this. Can I do this to God's glory? Can I do this to God's glory? That is, if I do this, will it enhance God's reputation in the world? Will those who watch me know that I know God just by watching my behavior? Or will I simply have to explain it away or apologize for it later? The Puritans used to talk about the Latin phrase, caram Deo, which means under the face of God. It's a reminder that God is always watching everything we do. Nothing escapes his notice. And that all of life must be lived for his approval. All I'm saying today may be summed up this way. People watch what we do and what we say and draw huge conclusions from the tiniest personal decisions. Living in the light of God's glory means to live so that others will draw the right conclusions as they watch us. We can give God glory verbally as David did in 1 Chronicles 29.10. It's called David's Prayer. It says this, David praised the Lord, 
in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are the strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. No, our God, we, now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. We should recognize that glory belongs to the Lord alone. No human was meant to be worshipped or, or given our allegiance to above our commitment to God and his glory. God's name is glorious. David wrote, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Folks, let your light shine. We display God's glory through Christ. Paul wrote, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in your hearts, our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Please understand, we best glorify God when we help give more of Jesus to everyone in every way. John Piper said it this way, God made us to reflect his glory. We are to be like well-polished mirrors of God's truth to the world or like prisms that take the beams of God's greatness and break them into lots of varied colors for the world to see in our actions and our words. That is what we should devote our lives to, end quote. So what does all this mean? It means that God is love. It means that when he created us for his glory, he also created us for our joy. He seeks to be glorified in us by making us satisfied in him. The good news of Christianity is that God is the kind of a God who is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So folks, enjoy your freedom. And don't see this duty to live each day for the glory of God as a burden because it's really freedom and joy. So glorify God's beauty and excellence by loving it and delighting in it. Glorify his power by trusting him with, with all the hard and threatening things in your life. Glorify God's generosity and kindness and grace by overflowing with gratitude. Glorify his wisdom by obeying his counsel. This is no heavy law. This is love. God is a God of infinite love, and his desire is to share all that, all that he is, with us for our enjoyment and to his glory. Let's pray. God, we just thank you again for, for your word, for these stories, all these writings, especially Paul here today that uh, challenges us, God, to just think deeper about uh, what's going on. We think about Paul and the life that he lived, and uh, it was not an easy life, of course, but uh, he, he reached so many people for you. And God, we want to be a part of that too, so I pray that you would encourage us here to reach out more, to be patient and kind and loving and uh, attractive to those around us, those that may not know Jesus at all yet. So I just thank you, and I pray for those that are here today that might be needing your healing touch, that you would come alongside them and bring the healing that only you can bring, God. For those that might, might be watching at home, I pray for them too. I know some of them are struggling with health issues and other things. So uh, we'll just lift them all up to you today and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great afternoon.